Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Dr. Jason Best. I'm a professor of astronomy and astrophysics and observatory director here at Shepherd University. I also hold the title of director of strategic research initiatives. I would like to welcome all of you to the president's lecture series, which is part of the Shepherd University Lifelong Learning Program. I'd like to either inform you or remind you, as the case may be, that following tonight's lecture, we will have a reception in the lobby. This reception is sponsored by the Shepherd University Foundation. We reach for new heights and reveal the unknown to the benefit of humankind. This is the vision statement of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, which is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year. This vision is a vision of exploration, not only scientific exploration, but of civic exploration. It is a more holistic vision than many of us realize. The story of NASA is a generational story. The men who had the right stuff inspired both rocket boys and hidden figures, the impact of both of these groups still being felt today. It's the story of a pair of tiny voyagers which are still traveling even as we speak. It's the story of a space telescope named Hubble which, once it received a new contact, lens is still seeing farther <laughs> than we'd ever expected. It is the triumph of the summer of 1969 when my parents heard a man say, that's one small step. And it is the tragedy of the winter of 1986 when I heard a man say, go it throttle up. It is the myth of the invention of the breakfast drink Tang, the space age drink, and the reality of the invention of technology helping in the current fight against breast cancer. Our presenter tonight is going to speak to us of numerous facets of NASA's exploration. He was described by a college friend of his as a rocket scientist to be from the hills of West Virginia. He has certainly lived up to that promise. He earned a bachelor's degree in physics, as well as master's and doctor's degrees in electrical engineering, all from Vanderbilt University. He has served as an IBM fellow, and since 2008, he's worked at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. While at the Goddard Center, he has led and supported radiation engineering efforts for multiple flight projects. He has led, managed, and developed his branch's civil service workforce. He has led an agency working group as part of the development of a draft of the agency-wide 28th strategic plan. He's currently responsible for coordinating agency-wide discipline technical activities. He is here tonight to discuss the sun and outer space as a natural hazard. Ladies and gentlemen, I would ask you to give an enthusiastic welcome home to our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Pelish. an introduction like that, I probably don't need to talk. I can just <laughs> stand up here and flip the charts. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Best, um, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, you know, the company at, at dinner earlier this evening was, was really fantastic. And I would like to thank um, Shepherd University, um, the president, and the coordinating help uh, that I received uh, in terms of preparing for this talk. Uh, really looking forward to coming back uh, here to Shepherdstown uh, to share some of my uh, interests, some of my passion uh, in the history of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration as it applies to uh, the sun and outer space as a natural hazard, which uh, Jason so uh, eloquently introduced. So um, without further ado, I'd like to get into the talk and uh, just uh, sort of mention and remind folks, if you have a question during the presentation, wave your hand. Um, I don't want to save all the questions until the end. <laughs> I see there's a dry run um, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the third row. But yes, legitimately, if you have a question, um, feel free to raise your hand, wave it around until I see you. I'd be happy to uh, answer those questions in real time. And I'm sure that we will have uh, plenty of time at the end of the talk uh, for general Q&A uh, about anything that's in the talk, about anything related to NASA, space in general. i uh, happy to answer those questions uh, to the best of my ability. So, um, 
I, I did want to start out the presentation at the beginning here with a bit of a NASA overview uh, for those of you that may or may not be familiar uh, with the different parts of our agency. Uh, it's actually composed of 10 uh, NASA field centers. Those are the red dots um, on, this, uh, on this picture of the, the continental, the lower 48. Um, and you can see that you know, we've got a couple of centers in uh, California, we've got centers in Texas, uh, we've got a center in uh, uh, Mississippi, we've got uh, Alabama, Florida, Virginia, uh, Maryland. Uh, we've got a couple of, uh, couple of different things in Maryland, D.C. Uh, and Ohio. And then the purple dots on this chart show the different component facilities, one of which uh, is the Software Independent Verification and Validation Facility, which is actually located in West Virginia. Uh, and that belongs to the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, as one of our, one of our four components. Uh, facilities around the country. So we have a very wide uh, stretch across the country. And then the one other dot you can see is sort of a uh, dark green color there in uh, Southern California. That's the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and that is NASA's one uh, federally funded research and development center. You'll know them as JPL. Um, they do uh, many of the Mars missions and other uh, science missions for the agency, but they have a much broader reach uh, because of their connections to Caltech. So we have a very large footprint uh, across the country, and that certainly flavors uh, a lot of the different missions uh, that we undertake as an agency. Um, Jason also mentioned uh, the 2018 NASA Strategic Plan, which was just released uh, about a month ago, actually. Um, he introduced the vision to discover and expand knowledge for the benefit of humanity. That vision actually was one of the things that influenced me pretty heavily uh, when I was thinking about different things that I wanted to do, different careers that I wanted to have. And I like, the, uh, I like the altruism of it um, a lot. Um, it's not just the science mission, but I think it actually crosses over uh, the four different strategic goals that we have in our current plan, discover, explore, develop, and enable. Uh, and that vision is really strapped uh, and woven through all, all four of those. That covers the science mission uh, that we do as an agency. That covers the aeronautics mission that we do as an agency. We actually just cut a contract uh, for our next X-plane. So we are, we are still in the aeronautics business. And that's a fascinating story. We don't have time to talk about it uh, tonight. If anybody asks a question about it, we can talk about it. That's a plant for later. Um, we have obviously human exploration, and then we have all of the necessary space technology uh, required to enable our aeronautics missions, our science missions, and our human exploration missions. So something a little bit more keen at hand um, for, for this evening. This is obviously a, a little bit of a play on Dr. Strangelove, um, but tonight's talk, uh, The Sun and Outer Space as a Natural Hazard, really traces its roots back to this uh, category or thing that I'll refer to as radiation effects. What is radiation effects? We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but this uh, sort of translucent box that I put on top of the, the Hubble, one of the Hubble uh, extreme deep field images, kind of tries to describe a little bit about what is within the field or the study of radiation effects as it applies to the space environment. And it is this really interesting thing that sits at the intersection of, as it says here, biology, chemistry, multiple branches of engineering, ethics, material science, physics, you could sort of keep the train going, uh, which means that there are a lot of different areas that you can specialize in. Um, I happen to be in one area, I have colleagues that are in other areas, uh, whether or not we focus on robotic unmanned spacecraft or whether we want to try to put humans in space, um, how, can we, how can we do that effectively? Um, and so the study of radiation effects is really tied to, uh, tied to a lot of that. Let me see if I can scoot a little closer to the microphone. Is that better for the folks in the audience? Yeah. I had the keyboard tray out. Um, so, oh, you're welcome. Um, I uh, just wanted to try to, to emphasize the multidisciplinary nature of it um, and that really what we're talking about is the effect of the radiation that is essentially omnipresent in the space environment, which we'll talk about a little bit more, and what effect it has on the things that we put in space as well as what effect it has on the Earth and the different things that we build on the Earth. Um, the, folks on the Earth directly. So uh, there's some pretty broad impacts uh, with that, and that's really going to be the subject uh, 
of, uh, of tonight's talk. So that's, that's the introduction for that. What I want to talk about next are some ways that we can think about visualizing, well, what are radiation effects? What does that look like? Um, this is a radiation effect. This is a really cool photo that was taken from the International Space Station uh, looking down on Scandinavia uh, at night. It was taken on the 3rd of April, 2015. And you can see that really cool uh, green aurora um, that goes, it's, so it's the Northern Lights, uh, but looking at it from space instead of down on the ground. So you can see it sort of has a, a vertical extent. There's a thickness uh, to it. That's the Earth's atmosphere. And that's caused by high energy radiation that's in the space environment impacting the Earth's atmosphere and essentially exciting uh, the molecules uh, that are, that are, in, uh, that are in, in the atmosphere and making them glow. Um, they're sort of getting excited and then they're uh, giving up some of that energy and when they discharge that energy, it glows uh, in the atmosphere. And you can get different colors depending on what the elements are in there. This happens to be green. There's a little bit of red uh, that you can see there uh, kind of towards the horizon on the top left of the figure. But that's a radiation effect. That's one example. There are many others. This is another radiation effect that uh, has uh, maybe some more uh, tangible consequences in terms of day-to-day -day life. Uh, in March of 1989, uh, there was a pretty significant uh, solar storm, we'll call it, and we'll talk a little bit more about kind of what that means. And when it happened, uh, it actually caused a significant enough disruption in the local environment around the Earth uh, that it knocked out uh, the power grid uh, in Quebec, and that actually sort of leaked into North America a little bit. Um, this is a very real, uh, very consequential example of the interaction between the sun and the Earth and how the space environment can be very real uh, for, for folks on the ground. There have been lots of other examples of this, maybe not quite as dramatic, uh, but every now and again, you'll see a headline or read a newspaper uh, that says, you know, the sun caused X, Y, or Z uh, to happen. And that's very much tied to the sun and outer space as a, as a hazard, as a natural hazard. The radiation in space um, that's sort of ever present as well as whatever the sun is doing to us um, can have uh, tangible consequences, um, certainly for folks on the ground, certainly for uh, robotic spacecraft uh, or humans uh, who are exploring space. So a brief history of the radiation effects community, and I should say that I've tried to keep the slides that are just words uh, to an absolute minimum in this, but this is an interesting progression that I think uh, is worth talking about. Folks got interested in studying radiation and its effect on materials and electronics uh, during, the, during the Cold War, really. I mean, it, if you want to think about it, you can actually trace it back a little bit further than that to the origins of, of NASA uh, in, in the 50s, in the late 50s, that is. Um, but it, it started to ramp up during the Cold War because there were a group of people uh, in the military who were very interested in how to develop uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, which you have to send into space. And somebody said, hmm, Maybe we should think about what's in the space environment if we want our stuff to survive, let alone what other people were trying to launch at us at the same time. Those kinds of things, weapons, also produce radiation environments. So you have sort of two pieces of it. You have the natural piece and you have the man-made piece, the, the person-made piece. Um, so a lot of those things were sort of conspiring in the late 50s and the early 60s, and so there was this branch of radiation effects uh, that developed, again, at the intersection of a lot of those different academic disciplines that I talked about earlier. Something that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail uh, was the discovery of these, these things called the Van Allen belts, um, which were observed in January and March, were first observed in January and March of 1958 with Explorer 1 and Explorer 3. Explorer 1 was the first uh, spacecraft uh, that NASA actually launched, which was, uh, which was pretty cool. Get some background music, which is awesome. Um, and uh, no, it's fine. Um, I actually was kind of trying to guess what that what the song was. No, no worries. Um, no worries at all. Um, so we move kind of from the Van Allen belts to really starting the space race um, with the signature of the Space Act by President Eisenhower, uh, July 29th, 1958. And shortly after that, President Kennedy was in office and he gave his famous address at Rice University on the nation's space effort. That was the going to the moon speech that I think most everybody is, is probably pretty familiar with. 
in September of 1961. And then, as I said, a lot of the folks who were interested in developing uh, the ICBMs and, and weapons, there was an event, uh, pretty famous actually, called Starfish Prime, which was a high altitude nuclear detonation uh, that happened on July 9th, 1962. It was uh, part of Operation Fishbowl, which was a smaller operation that was conducted within uh, something called Operation Dominic. Um, those both have very interesting histories in and of themselves. But Starfish Prime actually is notable because I mentioned these things about the Van Allen belts and we're gonna talk more about them. Um, Starfish Prime produced a lot of radiation that actually got trapped around the Earth and it stayed there for some time and it actually knocked out several of our early satellites uh, because of the residual radiation from that high altitude weapon detonation. And that's when I think people started really connecting the dots of a lot of the different things that we had to think about and be concerned with as we were designing systems uh, back in the early days of, uh, of the space age. And then of course, um, in August of 63, uh, they signed the limited test ban treaty and that type of atmospheric testing came to an end. Um, so fortunately, uh, we haven't had to concern ourselves uh, with those sorts of situations uh, since that time. Uh, but that's sort of uh, a flavor of the early history, how um, the field that I started out in came to be and then sort of progressed from that time. And eventually, the communities that were interested in studying uh, man-made radiation environments versus the natural space radiation environments we split. And the sort of natural space radiation environment, civil space, commercial space folks went one direction, and the military radiation effects folks went in another direction. Um, for, and that is also an interesting story which we don't really have, uh, we don't really have time to talk about tonight. But um, just to give you a little bit of background, that's about how old uh, a lot of this field of study is except for a few pieces, um, and those we'll talk about a little bit more. Now I want to, to get into uh, a, little bit of, uh, a little bit of science, a little bit of physics, um, and try to convince you that the Earth is like a bar magnet. The Earth is like a bar magnet and that it has a North Pole and a South Pole. I think most people are familiar with geographical North and geographical South. We also have magnetic North and magnetic South, and because the Earth is like a magnet, we call that a dipole, uh, a dipole magnet. Um, those magnetic field lines originate on one end of the bar magnet and they sort of loop around and they connect at the other end of the bar magnet. And that creates, sets up a magnetic field around the Earth. And with a magnetic field, you can both attract and repel uh, charged particles. Charged particles in this case are radiation. So if you assume that the Earth is like a bar magnet, then you would also assume that because of that magnetic field that we can actually trap radiation around the Earth. And it turns out that that's true. That trapped radiation around the Earth uh, forms belts or bands, which happen to be called uh, the Van Allen belts. And you can measure them. Um, you can actually see them if you sort of model or simulate it. So take away uh, the point from this. Earth is like a bar magnet. North and South Pole, because of the magnetic field that surrounds the Earth, it means that we can trap radiation. It also means that we can feel, sort of quote unquote, feel radiation that's coming at us from the sun uh, or from uh, extra solar sources, meaning outside the solar system. The next thing I want to try to convince you of is that the Earth and the sun are actually connected. This is a, it's a cartoon rendering uh, or an artist rendering. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, sort of the limb of the sun uh, sort of creeping in there, that orange disc with the, the prominences sticking out from it. And there's a sort of a, a bar um, or something that looks like it's being extruded across the middle. Uh, that's actually, uh, in this case, meant to be the solar wind. So the sun is always ejecting uh, particles, radiation, pieces of itself. It's giving off mass, um, matter, material, and it's accelerated in some cases to uh, pretty ridiculous speeds. Uh, in some cases, thousands of kilometers per second. Um, it's quite fast. And the Earth is that small blue dot over to the right-hand side of the picture, and those sort of yellow lines that are looping out of the Earth, uh, that's the Earth's magnetic field. 
And so you can see in this case, the solar wind and the mass being accelerated out of the sun is actually impacting the Earth's magnetic field. And instead of the Earth's magnetic field being nice and symmetrical, looking the same on both sides, it actually gets squished or pushed uh, by the solar wind, by the matter that's getting ejected out of the sun. And it produces this really long tail uh, that's always facing away from the sun. So as we're orbiting around the sun, and the Earth itself is obviously rotating, but then the Earth orbits around the sun, that tail is always sort of facing directly away from the sun. And so it moves around uh, in the solar system, uh, in, or in and around our orbit. So there's always a part that's facing the sun, and there's always a part that's sort of going away from the sun. But that magnetic field is how we are connected to the sun. So Earth is like a bar magnet. That bar magnet produces a magnetic field that actually connects us to the sun. And so that sun-earth connection is what results in many, many, many of the uh, radiation effects that you can experience when you're in the space environment around the Earth, and also results in the radiation effects that you can observe when you're actually on the Earth and the sun is misbehaving or there's a solar particle event. Uh, and we've got some really cool videos of what those actual solar particle events look like. Uh, and the consequences of what happens when the sun decides to have an event that is connected to the Earth in that uh, magnetic field and what, what actually happens with that. Before I go on, um, any questions, comments, things you want to ask? Okay, let's start over here in the back. Thank you. That's awesome. Question in the middle. No, it doesn't. It's actually uh, well outside of them. So the question was, does the moon affect the Earth's magnetic field or space weather? And the answer is no. Um, the moon has no magnetic field. And the magnetic field that's around the Earth, yes, part of that tail uh, that gets pushed out into uh, sort of the space between Earth and Mars, the moon will cross through that. Uh, but at that point, the field is so weak um, that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really have much of an effect. And the moon itself doesn't have a magnetic field. So about the most you could say that happens from the moon is if you had a spacecraft um, or something that was on the moon, the moon itself actually can act as a shield for radiation because it kind of gets in the way. Um, so in that sense, it could affect it, but not in the context that we're talking about here. Question in the middle. Interesting you say that. Um, so there, we actually, NASA has a mission called the Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission, MMS. And it's a, a tetrahedron of spacecraft, so four, four spacecraft flying in formation. And uh, it's actually designed to study an event called magnetic reconnection. And that is what happens when, so I mentioned Earth is like a bar magnet and anything that originates, a field line that originates on the North Pole has to eventually connect on the South Pole because as far as we know, we're not observing, at least on a large scale, a thing called a magnetic monopole, which is, that's an interesting discussion. Um, but these field lines always have to connect. But what happens sometimes, and this actually happens on the sun, those field lines can break open and there's a lot of energy that's stored in that magnetic field. So when it breaks open and then reconnects itself, you actually get a release of energy. And that's a mission designed specifically to study magnetic reconnection because that phenomenon that happens at a small scale on Earth happens at a very large scale on the sun. And we actually think that that's tied to a bunch of different phenomena. And that, again, sun-Earth connection is a big deal when it comes to radiation. Uh, that's a good question. Um, that's probably a better question for a heliophysicist um, than an electrical engineer. My guess is that that would be something that would happen incredibly quickly. And if it's happening around the Earth, the Earth's magnetic field is strong, but it's not that strong. Uh, we probably wouldn't notice. Um, if you had some really sensitive instrumentation, uh, you probably could. But you know, in terms of day-to-day -day life, I don't, I, don't think that, I don't think that we would see that. Um, any other questions over here? Okay.
So it's interesting, you mentioned uh, James Van Allen. He happens to be um, the person standing in the middle holding a model of the Explorer 1 satellite. Um, to his left is, uh, is Bill Pickering, who is the former director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and Werner von Braun uh, on, on the left-hand side in the picture, you know, facing this way, but on the right-hand side on the slide. Um, all pretty influential people, uh, not only in studying the Van Allen belts, but just in terms of the nation's space program in general. Werner von Braun obviously was uh, a pioneer with the, the V2, the development of the V2 rocket in, uh, in Germany, which was really the first, the first ballistic missile, um, and then came over um, to the United States and, and set up shop at the Redstone Arsenal uh, down outside of Huntsville, Alabama, which is now the site of the Marshall Space Flight Center. The Redstone Arsenal is still there. It's a, a large army base. Um, but just an example in terms of uh, how we uncovered information uh, about the Van Allen belts. You know, you can sort of see the history there prior to 1958. We were aware that there was radiation that could be trapped by the Earth's magnetic field, but we didn't actually know that such things existed. It's sort of a theoretical prediction. Uh, but it turns out that with Explorer 1, pardon me, launched into Earth's orbit um, in, uh, in January 1958, we were able to measure it. Um, and there was a whole bunch of successive campaigns that went on to sort of study the near-Earth space radiation environment as we were sort of creeping out into space, feeling, feeling out our surroundings. Um, so again, we don't have a lot of time to get into sort of the nitty-gritty of this, but I wanted to sort of bring along some of that history, uh, at least about how radiation behaves around the Earth uh, before we expand out to sort of talking about some of the behaviors uh, of the sun and how the sun drives a lot of the effects that we observe in interplanetary space and near Earth space. So space weather, what is it and why do you care? Why should you care? Um, I split this really into two different categories, uh, sort of following a weather and climate analogy. So space weather, you can see the description written there, um, authored by the the National Space Weather Program. Conditions on the sun and in the solar wind, which we kind of talked about in, in a couple of those artist renderings. The Earth's magnetosphere, that's our <coughs> sort of local magnetic field region. The ionosphere and thermosphere, which are parts of, parts of the Earth's uh, atmosphere, uh, that can influence the performance and reliability of space-borne and ground-based technological systems and can endanger human life or health. So fairly complete. Uh, definition in this case. But what it means is weather. Weather is a short-term phenomenon. That's the here and now. The next, the, what's the 10-day forecast? We would love to be able to get to the point where what's the 10-day space weather forecast? Right now, we've got it drilled down to maybe a day or two um, in terms of what's actually going to happen. But there are significant parts of uh, the U.S. government uh, that are actually looking and studying space weather in real time. So as I was talking about uh, over dinner right before the talk, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, which actually takes care of the National Weather Service, also has a Space Weather Prediction Center. And their responsibility is on the civilian side to actually watch space weather. That's their job. And they publish forecasts, they issue alerts. Um, those alerts go to the Federal Aviation Administration, those alerts go to the Department of Homeland Security, they go to the Federal Energy Regulation uh, folks and DOE and lots of, other, lots of other organizations. And there's a similar body um, for the Department of Defense. And the Air Force actually takes care of military space weather prediction. So it's something that we care very deeply about because of the impacts that it can have on our systems. Alternatively, we have space climate. And space climate is, as it says here, historical record or description of average daily and seasonal uh, space weather events. So it's sort of based on the past 50, 60 years of history what do we expect the space climate to do? And that alternates based on what the sun is doing because the sun actually goes through cycles where it's really active and then where it's really quiet. And so that can affect space climate um, and sort of our local neighborhood uh, in, the, in the solar system, the galaxy and the universe. Um, so I wanted to differentiate really between space weather and space climate. They're both really important. Space weather is sort of the here and now, what do I care about today or tomorrow? Space climate is based on that historical record what are the things that I need to worry about when I'm going to build a system? If I'm going to build a system that has to last for 10 years and it's a robotic exploration system, or I'm going to build a system that's going to have to operate for six months and it's going to carry people, 
what are the design parameters that I have to worry about with respect to the space environment. And that's based on the climatological record, and that's why it's important to be making these measurements so we can update our models, as opposed to space weather, which is very operational, very tactical. So just a few differences there, but kind of important in the grand scheme of things uh, in terms of how you actually build and operate a lot of systems that go into space or systems on the ground that are sensitive uh, to space weather, like the power grid. So. Uh, the sun produces some big events. This is a cool video um, that was, and it zooms in, so don't worry, um, that was actually filmed uh, with uh, something called the Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, which is a spacecraft uh, that we uh, was led and built large parts of it uh, in Greenbelt, Maryland, and we had a bunch of other uh, partners around the country and around the world, really, for that matter, that helped. Um, and it has four HD cameras that film in different wavelengths that are attached to it and it just stares at the sun and streams HD video all the time. There are other instrument packages that actually make, um, that actually make different measurements. I'll go back one if I can. Let's see if I can restart the video. Um, that actually uh, film in different wavelengths. They measure different aspects of the sun. They're looking invisible or um, uh, ultraviolet, X-ray, uh, that sort of thing. And with the, depending on the wavelength, you can understand different things about the sun. But this is an example of a solar particle event where the sun is ejecting maybe 100 billion tons of material in one shot. It looks relatively small because the sun is gigantic, um, but that's many, many, many times the size of Earth uh, in terms of the amount of material that it's going to shoot off and it's gonna travel really, really fast. And if we happen to be magnetically connected to the sun, our magnetic field is interacting with the sun's magnetic field, it can form sort of a particle superhighway to send that information, uh, that information, that radiation to us uh, very rapidly and it can have a very severe impact on systems that are around Earth, systems that are actually sitting, sitting on the Earth. It can knock out high frequency radio communication, disrupt GPS, mess with the power grid, uh, induce lots of uh, what we call ground currents uh, in pipes uh, and other things. Uh, so it's, it's definitely something that we have to pay attention to uh, in design. But these events, really bad ones, are really rare. Um, so it's a risk trade. How, uh, how important is the system? How robust does it have to be if you're going to design for something that might only happen you know, once every 50 years, once every 25 years? Um, so those are real questions that, uh, that lots of people struggle with uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So it's not just the people that are putting stuff in space. We certainly care about this um, very deeply. So from a NASA point of view and space weather, um, and I, I, in this case, I'm going to kind of merge space weather and space climate a little bit. NASA is the lead U.S. agency um, for, research of the, for research of the space environment, and I want to be very careful to differentiate between research and operations. There are other agencies that are responsible for operational space weather monitoring. NASA is on the research, research side. NASA collaborates with many of those other agencies, uh, industry, academia, and our international partners to transition that research to societal benefit. So we want to do what's called research to operations. We want to take our research and the good things that we're finding out and actually transition that to other government agencies, industry, academia, and our international partners um, so that they can actually operationalize it um, to deliver a societal benefit. NASA itself has a, a, unique, uh, a unique place for its space weather needs. We have lots of robotic unmanned missions, but we also put humans in space. Um, increasingly, there are commercial ventures that are wanting to put humans in space. They also are going to care very deeply about this. And unfortunately, uh, for better or worse, humans are not nearly as robust as materials and electronics that you sort of build the spacecraft out of. We are much more sensitive to radiation. Um, so understanding space weather and space climate is a big deal for putting folks in space, particularly when you want to put them outside of Earth's magnetic field, uh, say around the moon or at Mars, uh, it becomes a really big deal, not just because the radiation environment can be more severe, but because you're going to be there for a long time. And the longer you're exposed to that environment, the higher the risk becomes. We talked about the Sun-Earth connection a little bit. Um, this uh, slide is designed to explain uh, or at least discuss it in a little bit more detail. That Sun-Earth connection drives so many of the effects uh, because of the Sun's magnetic field interacting uh, with the Earth's magnetic field and upper atmosphere. Um, you know, most of the time, 
the space weather um, and those radiation effects are generally mild, but sometimes it can be extreme. As you would expect, the societal interest in space weather is gonna grow pretty rapidly if something happens. If part of the power grid gets knocked out or GPS signals get disrupted and Google Maps stops working, um, lots of people are gonna care. Um, you know, you can't check into your you know, restaurant or sporting event on Facebook because it doesn't know where you are. Um, so societal interest is gonna grow pretty rapidly if something, if something happens. Um, mitigating um, the impacts of space weather can be improved. We can make better measurements, we can have more measurements. This is sort of lobbying for, we want to do more missions that study the sun and study the sun-earth connection, um, as well as venturing deeper out into space. So w what's the space environment really look like between Earth and Mars? We can model it, but we don't really have a whole lot of measurements for what that looks like. Um, you could say the same thing about uh, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, some of the outer planets. We have missions that have gone to Jupiter and Saturn and, and beyond to some of the outer planets, but just very, very few uh, radiation environment measurements there. It turns out it's really important if you're gonna send something there and expect it to last for a long period of time. Uh, and existing observatories uh, that cover much of the Sun-Earth system, they do provide a unique starting place. We do know quite a bit, um, but I think there's always that thirst uh, for more knowledge. As I said before, the sun controls space weather. Um, these two images, two videos uh, on this slide are actually, they're, they're not the same event, um, but they're sort of designed to be somewhat similar. Um, you can see on the left, um, a similar solar particle event as we were seeing before. On the right-hand side, you actually have an instrument called a coronagraph um, that actually looks at the sun's corona. And you can see the sun really misbehaving. And in a minute, you're gonna see a bunch of, there. Um, that's that image, uh, that camera that's actually looking at the sun's corona, and you can see Mercury transiting in the back. That's that sort of bright star um, that's sliding across the middle of the frame. Uh, those streaks or specks or uh, snow on the windscreen, whatever you want to call it, those are actual individual particles of radiation that the camera is imaging in real time. They're sort of streaking through the pixels in the camera uh, and they're creating those tracks. Um, they're most likely uh, protons. A proton is a hydrogen atom with no electron, so it's just a, it's just a, bare, just a bare proton. Uh, they can be accelerated to fantastic energies and cover lots and lots of ground uh, in the space environment. And this, the SOHO uh, spacecraft, happens to be sitting out in interplanetary space, and its only job is to just stare at the sun. It just looks at the sun all the time. It looks at um, different parts of the sun, the sun's corona, uh, and really monitors for these type of solar particle events that can cause impacts to spacecraft that are in other places in interplanetary space around Earth and certainly effects on Earth itself. Um, so this is kind of a neat way to sort of visualize what space radiation actually looks like because you can image it in a camera. Um, those same things can impact people, can impact microprocessors, um, you know, things that take care of power regulation, life support, um, so you can imagine, um, you know, how quickly uh, the design space uh, explodes, no pun intended, when you start um, thinking about things like this. Any questions before we go on? Um, got a couple more charts to look at. Okay. So um, this is kind of a summary chart of uh, potential space weather hazards. I'm not going to break down uh, everything in here. In some cases, the text is, uh, is a little bit small. I tried to make it as big as I could on this chart. Um, but it really covers things that we think about uh, in terms of space weather hazards outside of our atmosphere, in our atmosphere, and down on the ground level. So you can see in the, in the top left, we're talking about radiation effects that occur on robotic spacecraft, as opposed to on the right-hand side in the top, we have to think about astronaut safety. As we talked about, you've got radiation impacts, radiobiological effects that can result in increased cancer risk. Um, if it's not an acute effect, it may be something chronic. Um, we, we think about that. And that's really where the ethics question comes in. You know, should we take public dollars and knowingly put people at risk uh, exploring in deep space? It's kind of a weighty question uh, to consider. Obviously, from a commercial standpoint, if people are willing to sign up and pay the money, you know, they're sort of taking, taking their own risk with that. But doing it as a, um, as a national agency using public dollars for that, does, it's, a, it's a different game all the way down to effects on the ground. Um, you see you've got like pictures of things down there called earth currents. Those are sort of the induced currents that can happen in pipes. 
uh, and power lines. You can disrupt uh, GPS receivers. You can get uh, uh, high frequency uh, radio interference. There's a neat picture there in the middle. Let me see if I can uh, use the mouse to kind of animate this a little bit. Uh, airline passenger radiation, something else to think about. When you fly, you actually uh, get a pretty, I mean, relatively speaking, as we're sitting here on the ground, a relatively healthy radiation dose uh, if you take uh, a long intercontinental flight, particularly if it covers high latitudes. Uh, we were talking about that a little bit at, at dinner, but um, the, uh, there, there's quite a few uh, different types of radiation that actually exist at about 40,000 feet, much more than they do here on the ground. Um, it's safe. You're not going to end up in a bad place by taking more airline flights, but there is more radiation at 40,000 feet than there is at a couple hundred feet. Um, and if the sun uh, decides to have a fairly significant solar particle event, and that happens while you're flying um, at altitude, uh, it can be much worse. And so that's one of the reasons why I mentioned that NOAA tends to report to the FAA when there's a significant uh, solar storm because they will alter the flight paths or they will change routes um, to avoid uh, exposing uh, the crew as well as the passengers uh, to unnecessary uh, radiation exposure. So it, it's very, very interwoven into terms of, uh, in terms of what we actually worry about uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and certainly over time. So measuring space weather, you know, we have lots of different assets uh, that, measure, uh, that measure space weather. We've got uh, spacecraft like GOES. So GOES is the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite. NASA actually builds the weather satellites for the weather service. Um, there's a, an interesting, uh, uh, some interesting uh, budgetary mechanisms that actually make that happen. Uh, but we have a partnership um, with NOAA through the Department of Commerce uh, that we actually build uh, and commission uh, the weather satellites and then hand them over uh, to NOAA to operate them. Again, NASA is, re NASA is research. We don't do operations. So we build the spacecraft because that's what we're really good at and then we turn it over to the Weather Service to actually operate on a 24-7, 365 basis. We just launched um, another GOES spacecraft um, right after this one. It's really, really cool pictures uh, of the Earth in, in stunning uh, high definition at this point, and it's really been a boon even just in the short time that these couple of new spacecraft uh, have been up in terms of what we are able to do with weather prediction. So we have a whole new series of spacecraft that are actually looking at continents as a whole, so sort of looking at all of North America. And then we have uh, spacecraft that are actually much closer into the Earth that are providing a lot more uh, sh sort of short range detail. Um, so again, that's a case where NASA is, is building all of those spacecraft for the Weather Service. Um, SOHO, um, we actually, that was the sort of snow on the windscreen picture. That's a, a picture of the SOHO spacecraft in the middle. And then we have ground-based uh, radiation uh, monitoring stations. This is a picture of a, a neutron monitor um, that exists on the South Pole. Um, so we're sort of monitoring what are the ground level effects uh, of radiation. So we're sort of merging all of these data streams all the time to keep an eye on uh, things that we might have to be concerned with. Future of space weather measurements. Uh, plan for launch in uh, February of 2019 is a European Space Agency mission called Solar Orbiter. It's gonna do exactly what it sounds like. It's gonna orbit the sun uh, at a much closer distance than any other spacecraft has. Um, with the exception of the one uh, on the right-hand side of, uh, of this slide called the NASA Parker Solar Probe. Uh, that was actually built at the um, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab, uh, and it just left the Goddard Space Flight Center from one of our uh, test chambers uh, before it gets shipped down to, uh, to Florida to be integrated on the launch vehicle. Uh, where planned launch for that is actually uh, July or August of this year. Um, so that's gonna be a pretty momentous event. The Parker Solar Probe is actually gonna fly so close to the sun, it's actually going to fly into the sun, you could say. So it's gonna fly into the solar corona, uh, which in some cases is pretty hot, um, th thousands of degrees. And so it's got on the front of the spacecraft, you can see it's sort of that big block, that's actually a heat shield. And that heat shield always has to point at the sun if any little part of it sort of drifts to the side or peeks out, it's essentially gonna get evaporated. Um, very challenging mission to design, um, challenging to operate, but it's gonna deliver just some awesome data. And then in terms of ground-based uh, assets, um, the Daniel K. Inouye uh, Solar Telescope uh, out in Hawaii, that's scheduled for completion in, in uh, 2019, and that's gonna be the largest ground-based solar telescope in the world uh, once it's finished. So we, we are getting new assets online uh, 
in terms of what our partners are launching, because NASA contributed instruments to Solar Orbiter. NASA funded um, and had a significant hand in the development of the Parker Solar Probe. Uh, and then we have uh, NSF assets like uh, uh, the Solar Telescope uh, in Hawaii. So lots of different angles you can come at this from, and there's gonna be more of that uh, going forward. And I just sort of had some bullets there that I talked about. Um, so understanding and mitigating space weather hazards, and this is the last slide before the conclusions, um, one of the things that we, we try to do is to simulate the space environment on the ground. And how would you do that? You would do it with particle accelerators. Um, so here's this connection back to high energy physics and particle physics, nuclear physics to some extent. We actually use physics-based particle accelerators. Uh, the one in the top left on this slide is uh, a superconducting cyclotron particle accelerator at Texas A&M University. Uh, the NASA Space Radiation Lab is at Brookhaven National Laboratory, and it actually operates off of what's called the booster synchrotron, which feeds the really giant um, uh, particle accelerator there. It's kind of a mini version of uh, CERN uh, in Switzerland and France. Uh, and then over on the right-hand side uh, is actually uh, modeling. So we do a lot of modeling and computer simulation of what happens when a really high-energy event impacts the Earth's atmosphere, and you can sort of see the particle track coming in from the, top of, uh, uh, from the top of that image down and all the sort of purple fuzz or hair that's coming off of that are sort of secondary particles that get generated when that single primary particle uh, impacts the Earth's atmosphere. And those little purple trails, that fuzz, that's actually what you see when you're at high altitude, as in like an airliner. Um, and some of those particles can be fairly long lived. Uh, I was telling folks over dinner, if you hold out your thumb uh, your thumbnail is about a square centimeter. There's about one particle per second uh, that goes through your thumbnail just sitting here in the auditorium. It's obviously not doing anything to you. It's probably never going to do anything to you, but it's here all the time. And, you know, way back in the day um, when uh, uh, particle physicists, before they had really high energy accelerators, they actually studied uh, what are called cosmic rays um, or some of that radiation that makes its way down to Earth, and they imaged it using... Uh, film plates. They would climb up on the side of a mountain or whatever, and they would actually expose film plates, and they would look at particle tracks uh, like this, and that was how a lot of early particle physics was conducted before we could build machines big enough and powerful enough uh, to accelerate them at will. So, um, in summary, the, uh, the Sun and the Sun-Earth connection drive space weather. I, I tried to I uh, tried to dive into that a little bit. It's really sort of the interplay between the magnetic fields and what happens when you dump a bunch of high energy charged particles uh, into those magnetic fields. The space weather hazards uh, can originate directly from stuff uh, ejected by the sun. So that's those coronal mass ejections and solar flares. Um, or uh, indirectly through secondary processes like that model uh, showed where you had the, the high energy uh, particle radiation impacting the Earth's atmosphere and sort of creating all those secondary events as it interacted with matter, slowing down, giving up energy um, to the, the other materials that are in the atmosphere. Measuring, understanding, and modeling, uh, and even predicting space weather is, is not trivial. Um, it's a significant challenge uh, that requires a lot of commitments and, and really collaboration at the nation state level. These are hard problems, they're expensive and tough to solve. And the only way that we can make forward progress with them is by working together. It's too expensive uh, and too difficult for sort of the go it alone approach. Future investments like we talked about with Solar Orbiter, the Parker Solar Probe and, and DKIST are certainly gonna yield new knowledge and there's things that you know, we're thinking about now or probably not even considering uh, that are gonna become relevant uh, going forward. And that's, ex that's exciting, that's encouraging uh, that that's gonna happen. And the development and implementation of existing and additional national policies are gonna help facilitate actions that are going to help further protect and further ensure uh, that space and ground-based technology and infrastructure uh, will operate the way that we expect it to, the way that we need it to uh, on a regular basis. NASA has a significant part to play in the research and development process as well as transitioning um, those developments, again, to other folks to deliver that societal benefit, the return uh, on initial investment, which really comes from, uh, you know, frankly, everybody sitting in the room. A question in the back? I just had a question, the other one was on... Yes. Uh, 
No, it does. It, ma it makes, it makes uh, good sense. Um, it's hmm, like a lot of uh, answers to questions like that. It's a little bit of both. Um, in some cases, um, it, it is a technological challenge. The Parker Solar Probe is an example of that. They had to engineer essentially the world's best heat shield to be able to launch and operate that mission so that it basically wouldn't be vaporized before it made any measurements. That's an example of a technological challenge. We have really good image sensors, image detectors that could take fantastic, you know, very useful, very beneficial uh, pictures of the sun um, and really sort of image that sun-earth connection, understand it, measure it. Um, in that case, it's, you know, essentially at the end of the day, it's a, it's a budgetary question. Um, there's only but um, so many dollars in the pot and there are a lot of priorities striving for those. I think space weather uh, and space climate has got, has got a lot of attention recently, um, particularly uh, towards the end of the, the prior administration. Uh, there were a couple of executive orders uh, that were put out that developed a national space weather policy and a national space weather action plan. It directed agencies to develop these things. They, they existed ad hoc, sort of loosely connected, but there wasn't a lot of top-down coordination. And there were prior uh, presidential policy directives um, that sort of poked folks uh, to go off and do that. Um, but that na National Space Weather Policy and the National Space Weather Action Plan, I think, really tried to focus the executive branch, the different parts of the executive branch, to act together um, in ways that we hadn't before. I mean, I think for life safety, um, and for sort of critical homeland security, um, you know, the power grid, for instance. Folks have been paying attention to that for some time, um, but I think the nuances uh, were, were being missed in some cases. And so I think we're doing a much better job of that now. We're figuring out different ways to partner um, with Japan and the European Space Agency uh, and other organizations and nation states that want to participate uh, in those enterprises. Question in the middle? Um, yeah, so we've, we've talked about that a little bit before, not, not here tonight. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, it would be a problem um, because that switch in polarity would result in a temporary, how long temporary is I think is kind of up for debate, suspension or dissolution of the Earth's magnetic field. That would be really bad. Um, <laughs> the, uh, there's actually a mission, um, it was the first Mars mission that the Goddard Space Flight Center did. It was launched in 2013, it was called MAVEN. It was uh, the Mars um, Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution. They got MAVEN out of those words, um, uh, mission. And it was designed to study what happened to Mars's atmosphere. And part of the conclusions that came out of that mission, you know, at one point uh, we think Mars had a magnetic field and then Mars's magnetic field went away, and essentially Mars's atmosphere got sandblasted by the solar wind and these solar particle events to the point where it almost doesn't have an atmosphere anymore. Um, so obviously we would want the Earth's magnetic field um, to come back, but that switch in polarity would, yeah, it would have a dramatic effect um, because you wouldn't imagine it like flipping a light switch. Um, there would be some lag I'm not qualified to tell you how long that lag would be when the magnetic field would flip. Um, but yeah, that would definitely have some, some realistic uh, impacts for anybody on Earth or anything that was in near Earth space and was designed to have the magnetic field oriented in one direction and to be present. Yes, there is, um, and there are a number of different connections between the study of the sun and the sun-earth connection, which we would call heliophysics and earth science, um, which is the study of the home planet. And, you know, I, it's worth saying that earth science is a lot more, <coughs> is, is a lot more than climate research. You know, NASA is in the business of providing data. We make measurements. We don't necessarily draw conclusions um, from those data. So 
our job is to gather the best data that are available. And I, I think that based on what I've talked about tonight uh, to some extent, you could see some of the parallels uh, between the two, that Sun-Earth connection um, in terms of what it's doing to, we, we didn't really talk about it that much, but when we talk about like the ionosphere and the thermosphere, sort of the outer reaches of our atmosphere are directly impacted by the solar wind, by the, by the activity levels of the sun. And as a matter of fact, when the sun is, uh, when the sun is active um, and it's irradiating Earth, it actually causes our atmosphere uh, to expand or to swell a little bit. We don't notice it here on the ground, uh, but it can actually increase drag uh, on spacecraft because our atmosphere sort of bulges out a little bit um, into low Earth orbit. Um, so yeah, there are, there are direct impacts on many aspects of Earth science um, that are affected by the Sun and that Sun-Earth connection. It's very, very real. Sure, yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, the, the best example, uh, at least that's sort of in the here and now, is the, the Solar Orbiter mission, uh, which is being uh, funded, developed, and launched by the European Space Agency. But NASA um, and the Naval Research Lab actually are developing several instruments that we are delivering to ESA. Um, all the time, um, the, the space agencies, the international space agencies, uh, are negotiating new agreements, new collaborations um, to figure out how to work together in different capacities. Those obviously have to exist in political reality, um, but there's a lot of will at, you know, not only at the technical level, but at the nation state level uh, to work together to see some of these things through because people understand how hard they are and how expensive they are. Many of these missions can take, um, you know, to get these really exquisite scientific instruments developed uh, debugged, uh, verified, validated uh, to the point where you can have confidence that they're going to operate for their whatever their mission lifetime is, that, that can take the better part of a decade. Um, and that's consistent, you know, dogged engineering and science work to see that through. Um, and so expecting one party, one organization uh, to do that all on their own all the time uh, is a pretty tall order. Uh, the Europeans obviously figured out a long time ago that you know, the French Space Agency, CNES, the German Space Agency, DLR, you know, and others. They're obviously not the only uh, countries in Europe that have their own space agencies, Roscosmos and Russia. Um, you know, they could get a lot further um, if they banded together, um, which was really the idea of the creation of the European Space Agency, um, which for a while they actually had their own passports. Um, they were sort of above single nation states. A question over there? So most of those missions, uh, it depends on their trajectory. So Solar Orbiter um, that the Europeans are going to launch as opposed to Parker Solar Probe, which NASA is going to launch, they will take slightly different trajectories. Some of them will actually use what we call gravitational assist, and they will actually take a spin or two around other planets uh, to actually drop them into the correct orbits. Uh, it's all a game of uh, mass, really, because mass is the thing that it constrains you, that's the expense, is getting all that stuff out of Earth's gravitational well. And so how efficiently can you get a mission to where you need it to be using, constrains you, that's the expense, expense is getting all that stuff out of um, Earth's so gravitational well. those two well. missions, because they're so planet how orbit, efficiently are slightly can you different. get a mission they're gonna take to different where you need it to, to be get there. using, constrains you, that's the expense, is getting all that stuff out of Earth's so gravitational well. those two well. missions, because of numbers of months, um, once you get and something take to where you need to be using, using check on average the missioning phase, where whoever launched it, whoever developed it, is going to make sure they the onus is on them to verify that it's working the way that you expect it to work, sort of as advertised, before they hand the keys whoever over developed it to whomever is, is going to make sure they the, the onus is on them the to verify that it's working the way that you expect it to work, sort of as advertised, you know, for before instance, they hand the keys over developed it to whomever is going to make sure they the, the onus is on them. A lot of the data um, from space telescopes, but part of the operations are actually done by a different organization. In some cases, the Goddard Space Flight Center is doing the operations. In some cases, we'll have a prime contractor like Lockheed 
do operations. So it really depends, and that's based on the proposal, uh, the way that the mission itself was proposed. But countable numbers of months, and then there's some checkout phase, and that's gonna vary. There's no sort of one size fits all uh, formula. Obviously that duration from launch to operations gets shorter if you're just going to low Earth orbit, like around the International Space Station, or maybe a little bit higher than that, because it doesn't take very long to get there. Uh, but in other cases, like going to Mars, that takes about nine months um, if it's the uh, well-aligned uh, in terms of trying to get from Earth to Mars, it's about nine months. Uh, but it can take a lot longer if Mars is on the other side of the solar system, if we're sort of opposite each other as opposed to closer together. Um, getting to the outer planets can be years. Um, before you, And you're doing checkout and sort of health monitoring along the way, like hopefully we show up and we're still in good shape. Um, and then you get there and it's you know, down to business uh, because in some cases you only get one shot uh, at making those measurements. And that'll be the case with uh, like the Parker Solar Probe is actually gonna have a fairly elliptical orbit and take dives down into the solar corona. Those instruments have to work because you only get a couple tries, you know, a handful, maybe two handfuls of tries to actually do that um, because that's the way the mission was designed. So um, it can be pretty critical. In other cases, you know, you have more, more schedule slack to work with. Question? Yep. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it had been it had been theorized um, the the existence of the Van Allen belts before that. Um, Sputnik was not designed to measure them. You know, if you were thinking about the context of hey, we're in a race, let's get something up there. Um, that's gonna basically send a radio beacon back, hey, we, we did it, you know, plant the flag. Um, they could have developed scientific instruments um, to put on there, but, you know, for them, that was not the approach that they chose to take. For us, um, you know, in the case of Explorer 1 and Explorer 3 that sort of made those initial measurements, that was, that was our programmatic choice uh, to do that. But it was, no, it was known publicly, um, or it was postulated publicly, uh, the, something what came to be called the Van Allen belts existed. That wasn't something that was secret. Um, I mean, it's it's been talked about in the context of, like, for instance, the solar wind. Um, we've talked about building like really gigantic solar sails um, to use as sort of a propulsion mechanism, it turns out you need a really, really big sail um, because <laughs> the, the amount of pressure that the solar wind exerts is actually pretty small. I mean, the radiation is tiny and it's not that, I mean, it's dense relative to space because space is empty, um, but it's not that dense relative to like a 15 mile an hour wind, um, you know, outside right now or something like on the Chesapeake Bay. It's not, it's not like that. Uh, it's pretty hard. I mean, this radiation, most of the radiation is really, really high in energy, relatively speaking. And so it's hard to sort of catch it. It's not dense, again, relatively speaking, and it's really, really high energy. So coming up with something that will stop it, you'd have to have so much, the density of that energy would have to be so high to do anything with it. That really doesn't exist unless you get really close to the sun. And we have, um, I mean, to some, I, I skipped over this part of the answer, but we have solar panels. Um, you know, not all radiation is, uh, is particle-based, so to speak. I mean, photons are massless particles, but that's part of the radiation that comes out of the sun. We have solar panels. So I guess that's a better answer to your question. So we are doing something with it. Um, but the, uh, the sort of nasty solar weather that I'm talking about here is from what we call ionizing radiation as opposed to non-ionizing radiation, which is sort of visible UV sunburn type radiation. That was a better physics teacher answer. One question in the back, I think that's the last one. Yes, yes, the magnetic field. I wouldn't say that they're of concern. I mean, the question got brought up earlier about, well, you know, the, the idea that periodically the Earth's magnetic field flips. The same thing happens, um, you know, the same thing happens uh, with, with the sun. Um, there's sort of, it goes through changes of its own. Um, 
Yeah, we've been studying it, and the, the Earth's magnetic field drifts. Um, so if you've ever, uh, uh, you know, done orienteering and whatnot, and you have a good compass um, that actually takes care of magnetic declination, the it drifts uh, with time. So, and that's something that people can monitor. You know, it'll drift, um, you know, some measurable fraction year over year. And you actually actually have to change the magnetic declination based on how old your map is, um, if that's something that you're doing. So yeah, I mean, that's something that the everyday, you know, everyday individuals can measure. But we certainly have a lot of very precise, uh, what we call magnetometer instruments um, on spacecraft that are taking a look at that on a regular basis. And that gets to the question that was asked about magnetic reconnection uh, and just general behavior of the Earth's magnetic field. So anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you will join us at the reception and continue your conversations with Dr. Keller.